Welcome back to Diamonds 2020, everyone. I'm so glad that you could be here. Diamonds 2020 is a free online conference for chronically ill Christians. And I'm here right now with Scott DeGroff, who is going to be teaching our last ses session of the day. Some of you might remember um, his wife, Lynn's session from earlier in the day, where she talked about caregiving and all of that. But Scott is here to share his own message, um, and he'll also be speaking again tomorrow. So you don't want to miss this. I, if you have not already entered the giveaway, we're doing one at the end of every single session. So you can do that. There's a link down below in the description of this video, and I will turn it over to Scott. Sorry about that, everyone. Some technical difficulties. Let's start that again. I'll turn over to Scott. Um, we had some audio problems. Thanks for you. Thank you for your patience. Hello, everybody. This is message number two. Uh, the title of this message is You Must Die. And um, I have to say, I'm super excited about this message and the truths, the biblical truths that we're going to talk about. These things have radically changed my life. And these things have, man, I'd have to say, um, other than my salvation, the things that we're going to talk about today through my chronic illness have been the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Yeah, so I'm super excited to, to talk with you about these things. Uh, turn, if you would, to John chapter 12 in your Bibles. John chapter 12, and we're going to just start in that chapter and read a couple, a couple verses here. You know what? I'd like to pray. I'd like to pray. If we could, as you're turning, let's just bow our heads. Father, in Joshua 9, um, it says in your word that they did not stop to ask the Lord. They did not stop to pray. And therefore, um, they were fooled. Uh, therefore, they did not go the right way. Lord, I don't care if it's a big thing. Um, I don't care if it's a small thing. We just would never want to do something apart from 100% total dependence on you. Your word says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And Lord, I can... I can see through the eye of faith. I can see them sitting in their recliners. I can see them sitting in bed. I can see them um, suffering and uh, longing, longing to um, kind of understand these things. And I just pray that your word would set them free today. Um, please give help by your spirit that your word would be clear and that, and that um, lives would be radically changed and conformed and set free all by the word of God for Christ's glory. We pray in his name. Amen. So John chapter 12, um, let's look at verse number 24, if you would. John chapter 12 and verse number 24. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So what I want you to notice is that... Um, the blessing that comes through death. 
That is a principle in the word of God. Um, it's funny, it seems crazy, but it is so 100% true that the greatest thing or things that have ever happened to you in all of your life have come through death. In fact, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say all of the blessings that have come in your life are, are as come through the conduit of death. It's amazing. It's a biblical principle. Death brings, like the verse says, fruit. Like if a grain of wheat falls into the ground, it, it, unless it does that, it remains alone. But if it does that, it bears much fruit. Um, yeah. So blessing comes through death. And we're going to talk about this idea that you must, you must die. Um, in fact, that's kind of like the gospel is an invitation to come and to receive Christ who died on the cross for us and to identify with him. Yeah, we'll look, we'll look more and more at that. So most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Go down to verse 27, if you would. Now, my soul is troubled. This is Christ speaking. My soul is troubled. He's suffering. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So Jesus Christ is looking forward in that verse to the worst suffering that any human being would ever endure in all of human history. He suffered millions of times more than you and I would ever even be capable of suffering. And I really want to encourage us to memorize this verse. Um, write it down in your notes, like put a mark by it in your Bible. But I really want to encourage you to memorize that. And when you suffer, when you are going through a trial, man, quote this to yourself. Maybe even uh, next time you walk into um, church or uh, walk into a gathering and somebody asks you how you are and maybe you're not doing that well. You could just quote this. My soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. How can you not admire the, the fierce determination of Christ to fulfill what God had sent him here to do? Um, in Peter, uh, he says, don't act like some strange thing is happening to you when you suffer. Um, he says that we're called to suffer. In James, he says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Um, we're going to look today at numerous things that Paul says. Um, so, so Christ came to earth to suffer. And he was not asking God, he was not asking his father to change his circumstances or to rescue him from his suffering. He was asking him to glorify his name through the suffering. And so right from the beginning, I just want to look at that example the, the two vitally important things. Number one, death brings blessing. And then number two, um, Christ was not committed to the life that he wanted to live, quote unquote. He was committed to the glory of God and whatever task the father had given him, that's what he wanted to be busy doing. So, so yeah, beautiful, beautiful example right from the beginning. I have a friend, um, he's a dear friend, and he was diagnosed with uh, cancer not long ago. And um, he's a young guy, he's got a young wife, he's got a beautiful little daughter. And um, I actually wrote him, because these things are very sober, because they're very serious. I wrote him and I asked him permission to use his story. And he wrote back and he said, he said that it's God's story that I can use it any way I want. <laughs> But I have to tell you, um, when I heard that he had cancer as a young guy, a servant of God, young marriage, young child, um, I definitely felt the pain of hearing that he had cancer. But man, I want to tell you, uh, when I heard that, I also in my heart, I rejoiced because I know this guy. I know his character. I know that he's dead already. That um, in Christ, uh, we'll look at this in a second, but I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so I know this guy is already sold out. I know that he's he's already dead to himself. He's already dead to any ambitions. He's already dead to his own will for his life, and he's living for God. And so cancer was just another glorious opportunity for the gospel. It was another glorious opportunity for the people of God to see how a person responds when they're dead already, that he's not terrified of physical death, right? In Peter, it says, who can harm you if you become followers of what is good? That even if cancer ran its course and took his physical life, it would usher him into the presence of Christ, which is what his heart truly longs for. And I just love that. Like when I heard that this particular guy got cancer, I just thought, I mean, of course, I felt the pain that they were feeling. Uh, the Bible says to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. But man, my heart rejoiced that that God had entrusted him with this conduit of blessing, that he had entrusted him with this platform to display for Christians and for a desperately needy world how a sold out disciple responds to suffering. And he did just that. Um, he, he did a great job of suffering for Christ's sake. So, um, yeah, the, the, I really, I have two points. If you're following along here today, um, I want to notice two points in the word of God. Number one, the blessings of already being dead. And then here in just a little bit, number two, the blessings of already being alive. So let's jump in first to the blessings of already being dead. Um, go to Galatians chapter two, if you would, in your Bible. Galatians chapter two. And we'll start with the verse that I quoted here just a minute ago. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're examining this idea of of the blessings of already being dead. And here, this scripture is in the context of, of um, the law. And it's saying basically that through death, our enslavement or our relationship to the law is broken. And it's saying that we're dead to that now. So we no longer relate to God through the Mosaic law. Um, we're, we're free. And so the New Testament talks about the law of liberty rather than relating to god through a set of rules we relate to god in a love relationship in colossians chapter 2 it says the handwriting of requirements which was against us has been taken out of the way having been nailed to the cross and you study that passage out um and it it seems to me for sure to be referring to the mosaic law that the mosaic law has been like the condemnation that comes through the law, because I'm a sinner, has been removed. It's been taken out of the way. I no longer live under that burden of guilt anymore. I'm set free from, from all of that. And so that brings me to one of the biggest points that I want to make is um, death brings freedom. And this is a biblical point. Death brings freedom freedom. Now we're going to see this over and over in, in the word of God. And I can hardly emphasize this enough. In fact, I earnestly pray that the Lord will apply this to your minds and apply this to your hearts. This is what I long for you for, not to be enslaved to any kind of sin, not to be enslaved to selfishness or bitterness or self-will, like what you dreamed your life would be, just to be set free from all of that. And the way you get there is through death. Now, I want to take this piece by piece. Um, and, and so I want to be systematic. And, and so you can see in the word of God where I'm coming from. But I just want to start um, in this point, the blessings of already being dead, by making this observation that death brings freedom. George Mueller was a man that was greatly used of God in the past. And um, he was very well known for proclaiming this principle. Um, in fact, there's a quote that says this, that this is him. 
There was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller, his opinions, his preferences, his tastes, his will. I died to the world, its approval or censure. I died to the approval or blame even of my brothers and my friends. And since then, I have only to show myself approved unto God. If you, if you read George Mueller's life, he was not talking about the day that he came to know Christ. Um, this was not something that he, this was not something that happened at his salvation. It was the real, the realization of the biblical truth at a certain moment in his life and the entering, the entering into that biblical truth at a certain moment in his Christian life. And he went from bearing all these weights for the care of these orphanages and, and the ministry that was really thriving. He went from bearing all that weight to himself to rolling all that weight upon God. And he said from then on out in his life, God carried the burden. And George Mueller was just dead. And so that is a living, breathing example that death brings freedom. Yeah, death to self brings freedom. So in the context... Um, in the context, it's our relationship to the law. Now, I want to move on to the next one, Galatians chapter 5. So turn to the right. For me, it's one page. Uh, turn to the right, if you would. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 24. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And so this, um, again, crucified, obviously a reference to death, and this is referring to the flesh. So in other words, the relationship between the believer and the flesh, um, we're dead to that. We do not have to let the flesh beat us up. Um, when the flesh suggests that you should be bitter, we do not have to live under the torment and let bitterness eat us up. When the flesh suggests that you should be selfish, um, when the flesh suggests that you should look around at your friends and what they're doing and the kind of life that they're living and suggest to you that you ought to be angry, that you can't do those things. That's the exact opposite of the way the Apostle Paul approached it. Um, you remember in the last message um, in Corinthians, Paul said, um, I rejoice in my infirmity. And infirmity is a physical inability to do that which my heart desires. He said, I boast in my infirmity. I glory in these things. Um, as soon as Paul recognized that the will of God was for him to suffer, he was like, sweet. I, I don't want anything else than the will of God in my life. And that's that's what I so badly want you to see is um, that, that um, the believer's relationship with the law is ended through death. The believer's relationship with um, the flesh is ended through death. Um, one more page to the right, Galatians chapter 6. This may be my favorite one. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So our relationship to the world has ended through Christ um, and our identification with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And so um, all of your hopes, you must die to those things. All of your dreams, the way that you imagined life going for you. Um, for me, it was, it was, I had a certain picture in my mind of what my service for God would look like. Um, we were just rolling. Uh, we had conferences scheduled three and four years out. We were flying um, mostly around North America, but three or four times a year flying around the world and serving the Lord. Um, it was really kind of a dream come true um, in that sense. And and then I went from a hundred mile an hour life to a two mile an hour life. At the beginning, we didn't even know if I was physically going to survive. And then little by little, acute illness turned into chronic illness. And what I have now is just a a very different um, ability than I used to. And in that kind of a circumstance, you can either get self-focused and you can become bitter, you can become depressed because of a self-focus, you could become angry, um, you could give up, 
you you know some people even get angry at God and rather than seeing it as the grace of God like Paul did in Corinthians and rather than seeing that hey this is a conduit for the glory of God like like Paul did in Corinthians rather than accepting the biblical view of suffering they can even get angry at God and say hey I have purpose to serve you um, you could heal me with the snap of a finger um, I'm a little bit angry at you that you haven't let my life go the way I want it to, which really that's just a religious form of selfishness. So this may be my favorite one. The world is crucified to me and I to the world. I earnestly plead with you, of course, for Christ's glory, but then I earnestly plead with you for your blessing, for your joy, for your peace, for your fruitfulness. You must die. You must die. You must die to your self-will, um, die to your earthly ambitions. Man, Titus talks about this, earthbound desires. Um, it's everywhere in, in the scriptures that, that we have to be dead to the way we wanted life to go. And we have to embrace whatever God's will is for us. And so I just love, man, I love this. I love this verse. You have to, as a mental decision, take the entire world Take, take your place in the world, um, all of your hopes and dreams, ambitions, everything, preferences. And then you just have to say, the world is crucified to me. Put it on a cross in your mind and just say, it's gone. It's dead. And then don't forget, right? The world is crucified to me and I to the world. I have no hopes for this world. That would be the biblical teaching. I have no ambitions in this world. The only reason I'm here is for the glory of God. The only world that I'm living for is, is the next world. So, so my hope is to build up treasure there. My hope is to live in such a way that Christ is honored there. That, that um, well, he says in his word, run the race as if to win the prize. And he's referring to the judgment seat of Christ when believers will give an account for their life and be reward, excuse me, rewarded by a gracious savior. So yeah, I love that verse. And I just can't stress enough um, the vital importance of embracing this. Um, just as a personal testimony, I've seen bitterness eat Christians alive. Um, and there's no excuse for it. It's funny because I have no desire to be hard on any of you that would hear this. And my desire is so much the opposite of being hard on you. But I have to tell you the truth. I have to love you by telling you the truth. There's no excuse for selfishness. There's no excuse for bitterness. There's no excuse for self-will. This is not what I pictured. This is not how I wanted life to go. Um, I'm not unsympathetic to you. My life is hard. I mean, it may not be as hard as your life, but in the past two months, um, it has been hard. Um, I can't even tell if maybe I'm going downhill. I don't know for sure, but I, um, it seems sometimes like I'm going downhill. Like I know what it is to suffer. I know what it is to weep day after day. Um, I'm saying it in that context to chronically ill people. This is what will set you free. The world is crucified to me and I to the world. So in simple English, I don't care. I don't care if I'm sick. I don't care if I'm healthy. I want to be in the will of God. If God entrusts me with this sickness, I pray he will get every ounce of glory he deserves from a servant like me. It's simple. You die to self and you live for him. I love this verse. This is so essential for a Christian. One, one more I want you to notice in this, in this, and then we'll move on to point number two. Go to Romans 6, if you would. Romans chapter 6. In verse number six, Romans chapter six and verse number six. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So I just want you to notice this last one that death sets you free from is sin. So we've seen biblically that death 
it puts an end to the believer's relationship with the law in the sense of relating to God through the medium of the law rather than through grace, through the law of liberty. Um, it puts to death the believer's relationship with the flesh. It puts to death the believer's relationship with the world. It puts to death the believer's relationship with sin. And then uh, he says, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. That's what I want for you. I want for you to live in the good of this to where you're free. Death brings freedom. If you hold on to your own will, that's a form of enslavement. It'll bring misery, suffering for you and for the people around you. Man, I long for you to be free. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. The life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It'd be so fun to go in more depth into these things. But I just, for our purposes today, I just want you to notice that death brings freedom. Um, yeah, you do not have to live under sin. When's the last time you saw someone um, really suffering because of sin? It's all around us, isn't it? We live in a sin-saturated world. We live in a society that's embracing sin rapidly, passionately. They call what is good evil, and they call what is evil good. It's everywhere. And you can see people suffer all the time um, because of because of sin. Yeah, I don't think I'll say more about that right now. Um, man, I long for God's people to not live like slaves, but to live free. And, and it's death to self. It's death to the world, death to the flesh, death to the law, death to sin. It's these things that brings about the freedom in a person's life that the Lord lo longs for you to have. So the blessings of already being dead are that death brings freedom. Now, I want to spend the rest of our time talking about the blessings of already being alive. Um, go first, if you would, to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. John 17. The blessing of already being alive. John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is um, to know God. It's interesting because I've never met anybody that believes that eternal life starts when you die. Um, nobody believes that. And yet somehow I had this kind of concept in my head that that heaven was going to be awesome and, and I kind of had this concept that I couldn't wait to begin my eternal life someday when theologically nobody believes that. Everybody believes, including me. I mean, it's so clear in the word of God. Everyone believes that you begin your eternal life the minute that you're saved, that you're reconciled to God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, right? Unless you're born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the minute that that happens to a person, they begin their reconciled eternal life with God. And this is really my point here is that the blessing of already being alive is life with Christ. You live your eternal life with Christ now. So I'm free to serve the Lord in any way that he wants me to. I'm free to spend as much time with him every day as he wants me to. Um, it blows my mind every day. And I mean it literally. Every day it blows my mind that I have a real relationship with God. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Yeah, I just can't believe it. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I just can't believe that we, we, we have that kind of a relationship with God. And, and these it's these things. The blessing of already being alive is eternal life with God. 
Um, flip a couple pages to the left to John chapter 10, if you would. John chapter 10 and verse number 28. He says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of his hand. So we have eternal life. You're in the, the son's hand. If that wasn't enough, you're also in the father's hand. No one can snatch you out of his hand. We'll read it here in a little bit in Romans 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Um, this is eternal life. Um, go to Romans 7. We have two more scriptures that we'll look at. Romans 7. And then we'll look at Romans 8 and we'll be done. Romans chapter 7, verse number 3. Again, I want you to notice the blessing that comes through death here. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. If you study this out carefully, you get this idea um, from the passage. You, you get the clear picture that we are engaged to Christ, that through death, um, our old relationship with the law is broken, right? And so just like a marriage, he uses that as an illustration, that, that two people are joined together, what God has joined together, let no man put to asunder. When one of those two people dies, the, the relationship is broken, and that second person is free. And so he's laying out this incredibly vital biblical principle that death brings freedom. And here, here he's saying that you are now free um, from the old relationship of relating to God through the law, and you are now engaged to and eagerly anticipating being wed to Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is amazing. <laughs> One of the most um, exciting times of my life was when I was engaged to my wife, Lynn. Man, I hated being away from her. I said goodbye to her at college and I cried in the car. I cried for two or three hours driving home. I hated going home. I had to go home and work for the summer. And then we were married at the end of the summer. I hated being away from her. And I longed for the day that we could be married and just live our lives together. And if we look at this passage, that, that's the period of life that we're in spiritually. Man, our relationship with Christ should reflect that. A, a love, a deep, passionate, focused, committed, sold out love for him where we show up every day. You know, during that phase of my life, I was working uh, 12, 14 hour days, most days. And still, when I would come home, I would grab my supper. I would go home and I would get our house phone. That was back in the days of house phones. And um, for three cents a minute, um, I would call Lynn and I would talk to her for one or two hours every night um, because it was the closest I could get to her. I never missed an appointment with her because she was the longing of my heart. She was the love. She was the love of my life. And as an engaged man, I was so focused, right? That ought to be what our relationship with Christ is like. And um, yeah, he's saying that through death, um, the relationship bro is broken. And now you have a new relationship. You're engaged to Christ. Um, man, how beautiful is that? Yeah, how beautiful is that? Romans 8, um, he says something three times here. And I want to end... I want to end this way. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse number 35. No, no, 31. Romans 8, 31. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And then for, skipping ahead to 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
verse 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 39, neither height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What I want you to notice is simple. Romans is the greatest exposition of the gospel that we have in the word of God. It is overwhelmingly by far the most exhaustive explanation of the gospel that exists in the word of God. And so you have chapter 1 through 512. Um, the first reason that man must be saved is you must be saved from the wrath of God. Look, look at it. Read it. You'll find that phrase over and over and over again. And then 513 through the end of 8, he gives the second reason why people desperately have to be saved. And that is you must be saved from the destruction of sin. These are both biblical, desperately needed um, reasons why a person must be saved. You must be saved from the wrath of God against sin. You must be saved from the destruction of sin. It destroys people. You must be saved from it. You must be set free from it. And then he ends that, that beautiful Holy Spirit inspired exposition of the gospel. He ends that with these three statements. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And my point is simple. The greatest way biblically that um, exists to emphasize a point is to repeat it three times. This is why sometimes theologians will refer to holiness as the controlling attribute of God. It's because the scripture says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, right? He repeats it three times to emphasize that attribute of God. So at the end of the greatest exposition that we have in the word of God about the gospel, he three times says, love of God, love of God in Christ, love of God. How amazing is that, right? So we draw from that a simple and yet a radical life-changing message that the point of salvation is a love relationship with Christ. Death is what brings a person into a love relationship with Christ. And I mean Christ's death on the cross. God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As many as received him, to them, he gave the right to be called children of God, to those who believe on his name. So when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved, we come into the good of that death. It sets us free from everything we talked about in point one. It sets us free to a new love relationship with God. That is the whole point. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So I just long for Christians to live in the good of this. You are not waiting to live your eternal life someday. We're supposed to live our eternal life every day now. The, the positional reality for every believer that's listening to this, the positional reality is that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But if we don't do what we read about in Romans 6, therefore reckon yourselves dead to sin. If we don't reckon that to be true, then we don't enter into the good of it. And we end up living like slaves to the law, still relating to God through the religious, religious practice. If we don't reckon it to be true, we end up living like slaves to the flesh, slaves to the world. We don't, we don't die to ambitions and personal desires. We end up living like slaves to those things rather than being free. Death brings freedom. In Luke 14, the Lord Jesus makes a kind of a radical statement, but <laughs> I think he knew what he was talking about. Um, he said, no one can be my disciple unless he forsakes all and follows me. When you truly die to self, when you truly give him everything, um, when you truly are like all in 
the, the yielded life, the spirit filled life. When that's truly you, the joy, the fullness of joy that comes is so amazing. It's, I can't describe it. The peace, the love relationship with God. In John 15, the Lord Jesus says, abide in my love. In Jude, keep yourselves in the love of God. Every other life is so not worth living. This is the only life that's worth living. And if you're sitting there in a recliner, if you're sitting there in bed, if you just love someone that is going through chronic illness, that, that can oftentimes be harder than the one going through it yourself. You must, you must embrace these biblical truths, die to self, and come into the freedom and the joy and the peace that God has for you. My infirmities, to use a biblical word, my physical inability to do that which my heart desire has become, other than my relationship with Christ, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me because it has ushered me into the enjoyment of a love relationship with Christ that I thought you had to wait to eternity. I thought you had to wait till eternity to enjoy the Lord like this. I didn't know communion like this was possible this side of eternity. I didn't know a love relationship like this was possible this side of eternity. It's all by grace. I didn't, I didn't set out on some great monastic journey of discipline and I earned this. Like that, that would be a foolish thought. Um, I, I yielded. I gave the Lord everything. I told the Lord all I cared about was him and all I wanted was him. And he took me on this journey, which the culmination of it was my physical sickness, my infirmity. And that ended up being the doorway through which God poured so much blessing into my life that I would never trade it for anything in the world. So I can honestly say, I don't care if I spend the rest of my life sick. And, and again, I suffer. I'm not saying this because I don't suffer. I do suffer. In some ways it's getting harder. In some ways the suffering is growing and deepening. Um, but I don't care if I spend the rest of my life sick or well, I want the will of God. And if he entrusts this specific thing to me, that's all I could ever want is, is what he wants for my life. So the blessings of already being dead is that death brings freedom. The blessings of already being alive is, is the enjoyment and the entering into the love relationship with Christ that we were given at salvation, that um, so many people, they live their Christian lives and they miss Christ. So Thank you. Um, I love you. Christ loves you. Lord bless you. I beg you for Christ's glory and for your eternal blessing. I beg you, look at these things in the scripture. Embrace them. Die to self and enter into God's blessing. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing session and I need to rewatch it. Um, Scott did shared so many amazing truths, and I um, am, got to the point where I'm like, I'm going to cry. It's so beautiful. Um, I'm, I hope that it encouraged you as well. Um, so, to, this is that was the last session of the day, but guess what? It is not the end of the conference. Tomorrow we have an entire day still of the conference with amazing speakers. We have. Um, Kara Swanson uh, speaking again. We have Becca speaking again from Lima's Lame. We have uh, KJ Ramsey speaking. We I'm speaking again. Um, Johnny Erickson Tata is going to be doing um, talking and to say hi with a little mini session. So you do not want to miss that. Scott is also going to be speaking again tomorrow. So if you have not already registered, you can do that at the conference link to the conference website in the in the in the description of this video. Um, at that same website, you can also find the the giveaway, and you can enter the giveaway for the conference. We're doing a giveaway at the end of every single conference session. So if you don't, if you want to win some amazing stuff, we have we still have awesome stuff. We've got clothing, we've got um, 
jewelry, we've got books, we've got <laughs> all kinds of stuff. So if you haven't entered that, you want to make sure to do that because we have a lot of winners. So you, your chances are pretty high, depending on how many people enter. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, another thing, there's the, the study guide. If you have not already gotten your copy of the study guide, the ebook is available for free. There's a link in the description of this video. Um, you can just go download that. It's, it's available on Amazon for free. Uh, this paperback version, there's also a link down in the description. Um, and this is pretty affordable. It is awesome for you if you love to take, you know, have room to write, to take notes, and just something to hold and not have to look at the screen. So this is, if this is for you, there's also a link down in the description and all of the proceeds will go to supporting the conference because while it is, um, I'm sorry, brain fog. <clears throat> while we are offering the conference and the study guide for free, it is not free for us to um, provide for you. So any support that you wanna give is a great help to us and to your fellow Spoonies and your co fellow uh, conference attendees so that we can continue to make this happen um, in future years to come. So that would be awesome if you want a study guide or if study guides are not your thing, you can go and visit the merch shop. We have a conference merch shop um, for the first time. This was not available last year. There is a link if you go to the conference website, that's where you can find the conference merch. We have sweatshirts and t-shirts and tank tops and a blanket and coffee mugs and um, phone covers and stickers and just all kinds of stuff over there. So if you want a, something, you know, a tangible reminder that you can hold and when you're struggling and remember, that, be reminded that you are not alone and that you are worth it and that you are loved, um, you definitely go treat yourself to something from the merch shop. There's all kinds of stuff over there. <clears throat> Again, the proceeds are going to help uh, make this conference happen in years to come. So you can go ahead and do that and you'll be encouraging and, and blessing your fellow chronically ill Christians and chronic illness warriors. So go ahead and treat yourself. It's a win-win. <laughs> um, finally, if you are... Um, if you don't know the schedule for tomorrow and you want to make sure that you don't miss any of the sessions that you think will most speak most um, powerfully to you, you can go ahead and also view that at the link in the description of this video to the conference website. And again, scroll down. It's not very far down, but for some reason, you know, we're having some trouble. So scroll down and the, the, the you can view the schedule there in your own time zone, which I personally think is kind of awesome because you know, I hate doing math and time zone <laughs> difficulties can be a problem for me. Um, so yes, make sure you don't miss that over there. <clears throat> I also want to just give a big shout out today to the conference staff. They are so amazing and they have supported me through this and they have done a lot of behind the scenes work and you have seen a lot of them over there in the live chat and in the comments and all of that. So just big shout out to them and thank you to them. Uh, speaking of the live chat, I know that it's it's so to me encouraging to be over there and to see you know there's other people who are in the same boat who struggle with the same things I do and to me that's so encouraging. But I know that last year a lot of people wanted to be able to connect with people on a more long term basis, and but you don't necessarily want to post your personal information on live public chat. So if you want to go down again to the link in to the conference website um, in the description of this video, you can go to, there's a private um, Diamonds 2020 conference community on Slack. So it's not on any social media, so we didn't exclude anyone who's, you know, on one or the other. Um, and you can go and do that and be part of the community for free. And you can connect with all of the other att conference attendees and the conference speakers and ask questions and just get to hang out with people who get it and people who who are who are in the same boat and struggle with the same thing so go over there you can privately message people there are group chats over there so yeah go ahead over there and make some friends because unfortunately the conference is going to end tomorrow and i don't want you to be left alone i want you to have some people you can talk to about this stuff 
because I know a lot of us don't necessarily know that many people who have the same experiences as we do or who, um, and it can be hard to meet people when we're stuck at home or, you know, whatever. We're, so that's a great place to make connections and make friends and obviously be wise and cautious. Um, but I don't, I want you to leave this conference tomorrow with encouragement that's going to last and knowing that you're not alone and with um, connections, you know, meeting other people who are in the same boat that is also going to last beyond the end of this conference because unfortunately we can't do this 24 <laughs> seven. So yeah, go ahead and over there for sure. Now um, for the giveaway for this session, we are giving away a, I will get there in a second. Once I, okay, there we go. We are giving away um, a gift card which is the first gift card that we've given away. This is provided by Ability Adaptive Wear. And what they, they are a company who has donated and sponsored this conference by donating this gift card. Um, and they are a company that makes adaptive clothing. So, you know, it'll work with whatever different needs you, you have. You know, someone was mentioning, um, Haley in her session was mentioning that she was looking for clothing to hide a heart monitor, but wasn't you know, and having trouble with her friend understanding that, well, this company makes clothing for all kinds of our chronic illness needs. So um, that is, uh, thank you again to Ability Adaptive Wear um, for the gift card. Now the winner of the gift card is, drum roll, um, Kelsey, congratulations, Kelsey. I will be emailing you after the conference with more information or, or some staff member will be emailing you after the conference with more information um, to claim your gift card. So congratulations, Kelsey. Again, if you haven't entered the giveaway, you can do that if you go down below to the link in the description of this video um, to the conference website. So definitely go ahead and do that. And also in the description of this video, you will find a link to Scott and Lynn's website. Um, they both spoke today and they were both so hugely encouraging to me. But you should definitely go check out their website for more encouraging content because they love ministering to um, to people. So make sure you go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, can't wait to see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Mountain Time. Again, schedule is in the link if you are not in Mountain Time. So see you then. Thanks for coming.